Proverbs specifically, uh, really throughout it, there's, there's these three characters. We see that there are those who are wise. We see those who um, are described as those who embrace God and his covenant work with his people. Wise people embrace the Lord and his work. We saw that there are simple people. The simple are those who are not committed to wisdom, following the Lord, the fear of the Lord, but really not, they're not really committed to folly either. They're kind of these nominal, middle of the road, not quite sure, haven't quite made a decision yet. And then we see that there were there are also the fools. And the foolish or the fools are those who are steadily opposed to God's covenant and his wisdom and his instruction. And uh, the 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 Proverbs are written with these three individuals in mind. They're not always called the wise, the simple, or the fool, but every inclination you know, and mentioning of those individuals kind of uh, points back to them. But what we're going to see this morning is something um, a little bit different. This uh, is the first kind of wisdom poem that Solomon writes. And so uh, Solomon, the, the wise king, Um, of Israel, writes a a large portion of Proverbs, and he's writing to his son. And and so last week we saw that he's writing to him to say, listen, do not be enticed by sinners. Okay, Don't do it. There's a way that is folly that, that leads to death and destruction. Son, do not consent. Right? Don't fall into that. And so uh, that was kind of the, the first, hey, don't be foolish, portion. And so this week is on the second half of chapter one is here's how, here's what wisdom is. Here's the first call to wisdom. And so Solomon writes to his son to say, hey, listen, this is what wisdom is. Here's the call to it. Heed this, my son. But what we're going to see is that wisdom isn't just this novel idea that the world has. No, wisdom is, as we saw in verse seven of chapter one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and knowledge, when put into application in the skill of godly living, is, is what really is true wisdom. But wisdom is more than that. What we're going to see this morning is that wisdom is a person who pleads with us to repent and not perish. I'm going to say that again. Wisdom is a person who pleads with us to repent and not perish. And so before we open God's word this morning, let's pray and ask God's blessing and his spirit upon our hearts this morning. Um, Oh, infinite, wise creator, God of heaven and earth, Father, we submit to you this morning um, and we come worshiping and praising you in word and in song this morning. And as we look to your word, one of the greatest revelations of who you are, Father, we pray that you would point us to what you are doing in your work, not just here in this passage, but throughout the whole of the scriptures, that we would see the the one little red thread that weaves throughout all of scripture. Father, by your spirit that you promise to pour out upon us throughout your word, God, I pray that that spirit would be at work among us, revealing um, the dark areas of our light, shining light into those areas, but also, Lord, would would remind us and, and convict us of, of great things and, and encourage us on in obedience to your word so that you, God, may be magnified. Father, this morning as we look to your word, Father, may we seek to make much of you. May we become smaller. May you become greater. We pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. So we're going to begin by looking at the first three verses here this morning, uh, or four verses, depends on how you count, I guess, 20, 21, 22, 23. That's four verses. There we go. I can add, I just can't put slides up here. Um, So verse 20, we're going to begin in verse 20. Again, this is Solomon writing here in this first wisdom poem. He says this, wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the market, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. And this is what she says in 22. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? 
How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. What we begin to see here is that uh, Solomon writes kind of personifying wisdom. And, and so wisdom here, it, it's not tips about a better life or how to live life better or how to live your best life now. That is not wisdom. No, wisdom even here is personified. A person in whom we can have a relationship with. And ultimately, that person and work and relationship that we can have is not with Lady Wisdom, but is ultimately with Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You see, when our vertical relationship with God is right through the person and work of Jesus, then our, our horizontal relationships are in order, are right as well. And Proverbs here, uh, throughout, not just here in these opening pieces, but throughout teaches us clearly that wisdom is, is personal. It's not ethereal. It's not something out there. No, it's it's personal. It's close. And so Solomon, in his great wisdom, says, I'm going to make this more personal. And it's really a, a poetic device that he uses here in personifying wisdom as, as a woman. And so typically throughout the, the Proverbs, she's known as lady wisdom or, or woman wisdom here. Uh, I want to be very, very clear this morning. I'm going to say this right off the bat. Jesus is not a woman. Okay, just to be clear, okay, so that's not what we're saying here, all right? Although Jesus is the wisdom of God, and, and Solomon uses this poetic device to personify wisdom as a woman, Jesus is not a woman. I can define what a woman is, okay? <laughs> Sorry, it just came to mind. <laughs> Jesus is not a woman, Okay. But Solomon, in, in his great poetic writing, uses this um, to get his reader's attention, to help us understand the personal nature uh, of this here. And it also, you've got to think, he's writing to his son. And so he's like, hey, son, there's this attractive woman who has wis is wisdom. This is what we should really be focusing on. And so he's, he's doing this for a couple reasons, to get our attention, to get his son's attention, to focus and, and really understand this. We also need to understand that, that in, in, in Latin-based languages, uh, Spanish, French, and, and also in, in Hebrew, um, nouns themselves have male and female connotations to them, okay? So if I tell you about the book, not the scriptures, but the book, it's el libro in Spanish. That, that's a, there's a male piece to it. If I talk about the apple, it's la manzana. It's an apple, but it's feminine. It has an A, la, L-A, and then an A at the end. So there's these, these pieces to it. As you can imagine, the, the Hebrew word for wisdom has a female piece to it. Okay, it, It's in the feminine form. It doesn't mean wisdom is a woman itself. It doesn't mean, ladies, that women are all the wise that there is and men are not. Okay? Not that it works, but the, the verb form, the noun form itself is feminine. So Solomon says, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we just go with how it's written? Right? It's often in, it is in the feminine form there. What we're also uh, really helping to draw on here, Solomon later in, in eight chapters 8 and chapter 9, where it kind of revisits Lady Wisdom and the, wisdom, uh, the woman of wisdom here, and he shows that the woman of wisdom is not ethereal. She's not really a person, but she ultimately stands for God's wisdom being revealed through Solomon in the Proverbs. That's what Solomon tells us in chapters 8 and 9. But God himself doesn't just do this in Proverbs. He ultimately reveals that Jesus is the wisdom of God. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 24, and then in 30 and 31, Paul writes this, chapter 1, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So here, Paul is saying, listen, Jesus is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
in human form, put on display among us. And he goes on just a few verses later and reminds people. He says, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Twice here we see that Jesus is the wisdom of God, the wisdom from God, and he brings righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that it is written that the one who boasts would not boast in themselves, but boast in the Lord. Man, is there a lot of wisdom in the world that boasts in themselves, isn't there? And Paul here says, no, the wisdom of God, the wisdom from God, demonstrated in Christ and His redemption plan, that's wisdom. So that you may not boast in yourself, but to boast in Him. Jesus is, and this is only one, one place that Paul talks about it, but the Scriptures really point at it everywhere else, that Jesus is the embodiment and full fulfillment of the wisdom of God, just as he is the embodiment of the Word of God, as John talks about in John 1, that the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that Jesus is the embodiment, the fulfillment of, of the Word, the Logos, the Word of God in flesh. And so we see that not just that Jesus is the Word of God, but he is the wisdom of God as well. And so therefore, the only way for us to become wise, to truly know wisdom, is to know Christ. If He is, as the Scriptures put forth, the wisdom of God, and I'm going to tell you that He is, according to the Scriptures, then the only way for us to be wise is to accept Jesus' invitation into personal relationship by faith with Him. That's the only way for us to become wise. And that invitation is really what, what, what Solomon is personifying here in the beginning of this chapter. This, this invitation here in chapter 1 it is really presented as this prophetess in, in the streets, and she is crying. Look, at, She's crying out in all of the public places where there would be tons of people in the streets, in the markets, at the head of the noisy streets, at the entrance of the city gate. She would be crying aloud. Wisdom is not something that is hidden or to be discovered like a geocache little uh, discovery or, or a little trail or a map with an X on it. Wisdom is at every corner crying aloud. It is not something that is veiled but is discoverable. And she cries, and Solomon puts her forth as a voice to be heard. And the connotation here is for to hear her voice and begin this relationship. I mean, even what, what she says here, that how long, how long will you love being simple or be scoffers or hate being hate knowledge? How long? How long will you be foolish? How long will you be content with being simple? See, because to refuse to hear her voice, the implication here is that, that you're a fool and that there's ultimately judgment and death to come. But, but to hear her voice and, and to begin a relationship, to pursue wisdom is, is to be wise and live. That's what 23 uh, begins to, to tell us. It's a clear call to repentance here. If you turn at my reproof, verse 23 tells us. Now, that is literally what, what repent means. It means to, to make a 180, to turn the opposite direction. And so the, the, the physicality of if you turn at my reproof, she's, she's confronting them, and they're turning away from what she's confronting them with. There's a repentance here. And so listen to this conditional statement. If you do this, verse 23, behold. Now, I know I've talked about this a few times, but behold is a, it's a very important statement in, in Hebrew. We need to latch on to that. This is something, this is God's way of highlighting something that is really important for us to understand. Anytime you see behold in the scripture, it's like a giant exclamation mark. It's pretty much highlighted after that. All right? Behold. What will happen if you repent, if you turn at my reproof, I will. And there's two um, really important promises here. If you heed the way of wisdom, if you hear 
Christ, if you, if you repent of this waywardness and you turn, I will do two things. We see number one is the receiving of the Spirit of God. I will pour out my Spirit to you. It's not something we often hear in the Old Testament, but it is when we do, it perks our ears. I will pour out my Spirit on you. Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel has this in Ezekiel 36, where he says, listen, I will give, give you a new heart and plant my Spirit within you. There's this beauty of these promises that what God is going to do is renew something in the turning away and in the repentance. That's the first promise, that the, there will be a receiving of the Spirit. And then and secondly, I will make my words known to you. There is this beautiful picture in the midst of uh, the Scripture that, that really puts the Spirit of God and the Word of God with one another. Colossians chapter 3, in 16 and 17, and then uh, Ephesians 5 puts these beautiful things together that, that the Word of God would dwell in us richly. The same term used for, for the, the Spirit dwelling in our hearts and our minds from, from, chapter, or from Acts. That, that the Spirit of God would dwell in us, that the Word of Christ would dwell in us, and that we would then use it, what, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another. There'd be mutual encouragement. The, our scripture always puts together the Word of God and the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God that gives us the Word of God reveals it to us by the work of God in our hearts. God does that. And so we need to heed and understand that there are these two great promises in the midst of this crying out here. And this is simply what we need to do based on these four simple verses. The way of wisdom is Jesus. He is the wisdom of God put on display. Therefore, accepting Jesus is the call here. Our call is to accept Jesus, who is the wisdom of God. That's what this, this personification helps point out. Now, in the time, it was for Israel. You need to heed the way of wisdom and turn from your waywardness so that, so that God would show his favor upon you. But we live on this side of the cross. And ultimately, this had, yes, a, an initial, a, a, an in-context for the people then, but it also points forward to Jesus, the greatest revelation of God's wisdom. He says that we need to accept Jesus, who is the wisdom of God. And this repentance here is not just a, a one-time thing. Many of you could tell me your story and how you know that day and you remember the time or the place and when you knelt down and you surrendered your life to Christ. That's wonderful. You surrendered to his lordship. You recognized him as savior at that moment. And that is good and right and wonderful. The spirit of God working in the midst of your heart to bring about uh, restoration and, and, and really to remind us and bring us to repentance. It's a beautiful thing. But the word used for repentance is in what's called an infinite term. It's not a moment. It's not a finite thing. It's not a decision. No, the term repentance is a finite, infinite word in its writing. What does that mean? That means that there is a daily turning to God over and above the things in our hearts and lives every single Repentance is not a moment, it's a lifestyle. Continual, never-ending, ongoing, over and over practice. There wasn't a moment that we repented. That was the moment we started repenting daily. And that's how we respond to the wisdom of God to accept Christ, to repent of our sin, and accept Christ, who is the wisdom of God. Solomon goes on and, and, and begins 
in verses 24 through 32 to say, okay, listen, here's the cry. Here's the call of wisdom and, and points. To, listen, there is something you need to do. You need to repent. And there's these two promises. But, but if you don't, there is a warning here. Verses 24 through 32 are a warning. He's, he's writing to his son. Okay. And he's, he's warning him. He says, listen, starting in verse 24, because here's why you need to repent. And if you don't, here's why, because I have called and you have refused to listen. Look at the, the obstinance there. The, the woman of wisdom is called, but there's been a, a hardness of heart, a refusal to listen, a, a la, 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 like just, you know, hands over the ears, earmuffs, not wanting to listen. Because you have done so, I have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. I've, I've been there to help. I've, I've reached out. Nope. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I mean, those are two very strong verses that, that demonstrate the, the heart posture. Like, if you don't do these things, if, if you refuse to listen, you're not heeding my hand, you're ignoring my counsel, and you have none of my reproof, this is what's going to happen. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind and when distress and anguish come upon you. I want to pause here for just a moment in 26 and 27 because this is clearly judgment language that is really drawn from other parts of Scripture. Uh, Psalm 2 recounts that the Lord is the one who laughs and ridicules the wicked. That, that's what you're, we're recounting here. Solomon is pulling from the psalmist and saying, listen, the Lord is the one who laughs and ridicules you. And so wisdom does the same. And uh, Psalm 83 recounts that the Lord's judgment is what? Is a storm. Psalm 83. The Lord's judgment is a storm. And so when terror strikes you like a storm... Your calamity comes like a whirlwind. You know, it's almost the, the coming true of hell hath no fury like a scorned woman. Wisdom personified as a woman is scorned and not listened to and reproved. And the Lord says, there's judgment coming then. See, 28, we'll continue on. They will call upon me, but I will not answer. There will come a day when those who are in the midst of this, in the midst of terror and calamity and, and strife, will call, but wisdom will not be there. There's a day where that runs out. They will seek me diligently, 28 goes on, but will not find me. Why? Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. There's that phrase. If, if you have your Bible, I, I would encourage you to, to underline that, the fear of the Lord here. Remember, uh, verse 7, the fear of the Lord, what? Is the beginning of knowledge. And here what we see is that those who re reprove, those who do not heed wisdom's call, they hated knowledge, right? That's what we saw of those who are foolish. They hated knowledge at the beginning here in, in verse 24, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Look, there was a choice. They had a, a conscious decision to make here, and they hated knowledge, and they chose not to fear the Lord. Because they did that, and they would not have my counsel, and they despised all my reproof. Those are, again, pretty strong words, aren't they? What happens? Therefore, they shall not eat the fruit of the, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. For the simple are killed by their turning away, and the complacency of fools destroys them. Verse 31 should sound slightly familiar to us because it, it's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1. That because of the lust and the disgustingness in the hearts of men and women, he turned them over to their own devices. He gave them up to them. They have the fill of their own devices. They eat the fruit of their way. And ultimately, what, what, what Solomon is doing here is we see the cry of the call of wisdom to accept Christ, who is the wisdom of God. And what we see here is a, a moving from, from that cry, and that, that, that here, heed this warning to, now here's the sentencing, if you don't. This is the sentencing of what happens if you reject Jesus. And so rejecting Jesus will wreak havoc on your life. Rejecting Jesus will wreak havoc on your life. 
Uh, the word calamity that's used twice here are things that will wreck your life or things that go bad. And terror are the things that we fear most. And as I say that, each one of us go, ah, I know what that is. It's different for each of us. And yet at the same time, we all have it. It's common to us. Wisdom here warns us that refusing, the, the, that refusing Lady Wisdom, refusing the way of wisdom means that our nightmares will come true. Calamity will come. Terror will strike like a storm. And calamity comes like a whirlwind. And that the things that we lie awake at night strategizing how to avoid are the very things that come to pass when we reject wisdom. We spend so much time worrying about them and rejecting wisdom that... Think about this for a moment. The hidden sin, the unseen disgustingness of our hearts that we hide from one another, what we think we hide from God, whether that be sins of omission, the things that we don't do that we know that we should, or the sins of commission, the sins that you know you shouldn't do, but you do them anyway. And we all have them. We all do them, one way or the other. And what wisdom here is warning is, listen, if you refuse me, if you reject me, there is havoc to have on your life. There is judgment to come. Even if they don't catch up with you in this life, there is a day, a day, when at the judgment seat all will be revealed. You may fool us. You may keep that sin or the, 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 the destruction in the midst of your life. You may keep it secret. But as the famous preacher R.G. Lee said, payday someday comes to all of us. Eventually, the heed here is that it will be too late to repent. It will be too late to turn and look for that wisdom. See, they search for wisdom on the day of calamity and they don't find it. I can't help but think of Jesus' words as they cry out, Lord, Lord, and he says, go away for I never knew you. I want you to understand something. This is not a failure of effort on this, these individuals' parts. This is not a failure of desire. No, it's a failure of seeing Jesus. It's a failure of faith in Him to, to, to refuse to have faith in the One who has come, the wisdom of God to be revealed. It's not a failure of effort or desire. It's a call here to move God's people from inaction and apathy to action and obedience. I'm going to say that again because it's really important for us this morning that th this call here is, is to awake us from our complacency, to awaken us from uh, our, just, our nominal uh, consumeristic con uh, perspective towards our uh, faith and to move us from inaction and apathy to action and obedience. And that's the warning at the ends of these verses. The simple are killed, what? By their turning away. They're turning away from the way of wisdom to, to continue to walk in the way that they so desire, to continue to walk as they think is wise. Can we just be really clear about what the Scripture teaches? That the the foolishness of God is still wiser than the wisest of men. And so to continue to walk in our own way is still stupider than the, the dumbest plan of God, okay? The simple are killed by that. And the complacency of fools destroys them. Look at that. The fools didn't do anything. They, they were complacent. You say, well, does that mean they, just, they were just in action? They just came and sat? No. Complacency is when one is smug with your own actions or your own achievements. You go, you know what? 
I'm perfectly fine because I know that I've done enough. I'm good. That's complacency. Like, eh, I'm fine. I'm. They thought, you know what? I've, I've reached the top of the mountain. I've arrived. I don't need to go anywhere else. I'm going to park my car right here. I'm good. That's a complacency here that the foolish have and you know what look what it does it destroys them it destroys them there may be those of us and i i I'm, I'm so mindful that this may be i think one of the most disastrous diseases in the american church the american church by and large has become complacent they're content with where they are. They've just, you know what? I'm okay. Our actions and our achievements were good. We don't need to continue to, to teach the Word of God, to, to conform to the Word of God, to, to renew our hearts and minds in these things, to continue to, to hold them up as, as not only important, but yes, they are the truth. The American church has, has turned into a consumeristic machine that says if you come and consume religious goods, you're good. Go away, for I never knew you. Those words should drive us to be concerned with whether we actually know the living God. Do we have that personal relationship with Christ? A daily, regular, ongoing repentance. Jesus didn't die so we could sit here and consume religious goods. He died so that we could go and fulfill the Great Commission. To go do that. And I think the American church has grown complacent in that. We were content with, uh, to put it crassly, butts and bucks. As long as there's enough people in the seats and the budget is met, we're good. I'm not worried about it. So the, the call here is to not reject Jesus, not to have inaction and apathy towards the wisdom of God, but to turn in action and obedience to Him. And, and that really leads us to, to the last verse. Solomon writes and gives this incredible one half a sentence one line assurance here to his son and 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 to us as well i've often said if you've been here for any bit of time that but is one of my favorite words in the scripture because it's a turning point we have 32 verses of calamity screaming prophetess at the corners you need to repent. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to die. There's going to be a day when you have to pay the piper. But remember, remember when, when I described the foolish last week and I said, you know, they reject God. They're, they're deserving of judgment, yet not without hope. Okay? Here this is. A glean of hope. A tiny glimmer of a stone in the midst of a muddy mess. But whoever listens to me whoever listens to me will dwell secure and will be at ease look at those two promises there they will if you if you heed the words of wisdom dwelling secure and will be at ease and so here's what we see about it accepting jesus leads to true life if we accept the, the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ incarnate, the wisdom of God incarnate, then accepting Him leads to true life, a, a dwelling. If you listen to that voice, if you heed my words, which by the way, we're going to continue in next week in Luke chapter 5. Okay? The words of Christ. If you heed these words, you will dwell secure. And will be at ease. Without dread of disaster, that calamity, that terror, the things that keep you up at night won't be it. It won't be there anymore. Not that disaster and, and strife and difficulties will just disappear from your life. Okay, please hear me. This is not prosperity gospel. If you believe in Jesus, everything goes away and vanishes and everything's good. Okay, not the case. I love Jesus, and I get the opportunity to serve him as an elder, and my life is a train wreck at times, okay? And difficult, and strife, and hard. 
And yet I can dwell secure and at ease because I know the one who holds me. Because I've looked to the way of wisdom, I have security in life. And not this life, but eternal life. True life. Because what Christ has done. You see, while the simple here in in verse 32, they turn away and they perish and the complacent fool is swept away. Those who accept wisdom, who heed their call, who are in personal relationship, they live securely and unafraid of danger. There was a day when I was a Christian where I was always concerned about every alleyway, ever being alone, ever worried about what was going to happen to me. And when I came to Christ, that went away. I no longer worry about driving alone in the dark at night. I no longer worry about walking down an alley because here's what I know. My God is with me. Every moment. And that doesn't mean calamity may not come. It just means that God's got this. And so that guy wants my wallet, so be it. God's going to bring it back. I'm okay with that. And if he doesn't, I'm going to be okay. That I can be all right having COVID and a concussion and knee surgery and a DVT and get through all that and go, my God is still good. For Israel, as as Israel's hearing these things, for them it was dwelling safely in the land. Remember we talked about the kingdom of God a few weeks ago. Uh, God's people under God's rule in God's place. And that's what Israel was looking for, a safe dwelling without fear of an enemy or exile. They could dwell secure. Brothers and sisters, for us, as we survey the whole of the scripture and this proverb, in light of that, we can dwell secure, living with God forever in his new creation. That's the hope for us in the midst of this proverb. We experience this confidence now, some of it, right? It's an already but a not yet. This is how the kingdom is situated at this point. We live in the middle of that. Christ has already come. The kingdom of God is at hand. It has been inaugurated. It has begun, but it is not yet completed. And so we live in this confidence, ultimately knowing that Christ wins and puts our enemies, sin, Satan, and death to an end. I'm sorry to ruin the book for you, but if you haven't read Revelation, Jesus wins. Okay, that's it. This is the way that. But that should give us great confidence and knowledge. This knowledge of understanding that should enable us to what? Rest well and sleep soundly. Brothers and sisters, if you are one who does not rest well and sleep soundly at night, I am I'm deeply sorry. I know that many Many have difficulty with that. Some, it's more of a medical condition, but for others, we may want to take a moment to examine our hearts and our souls and decide, really begin to allow the Word of God to examine us that say, am I not resting well because I am not fully releasing everything that I need to to Jesus? Am I holding on to that worry? Am I concerned about it? Because here, the, the Solomon writes and tells us that whoever listens to the way of wisdom, they dwell secure and will be at ease in the Lord. That we can rest well without nightmares or worry of our disasters or calamities coming true. Not because those things will not come upon us, but because I know the one who holds the anchor in the storm. That's our God. And so the call of wisdom is to turn and repent to accept Jesus as the wisdom of God, but to be warned that rejecting Jesus wreaks havoc on our lives. But accepting Jesus leads to true life. That's why every week when we finish looking at the Scriptures, we We then recount and recall the means of grace by which Christ reminds us of which he's given us all these benefits and graces to us and mercy to us in communion. Because in the midst of that, Christ is reminding us, assuring our fickle, feeble, sad, and and really doubting hearts that what I did is indeed true, sufficient, 
right and a grace to you. And you can be reminded of that in the midst of fellow brothers and sisters who are holding to that same faith. That's why we turn from the Word to the Word incarnate every single week. And so let's prepare our hearts as we do that this morning. Gracious God, we praise you and thank you for your Word. We thank you that you have, uh, by the Spirit of God, given the Word of God, both in writing through, Lord, the authors of, of the Scriptures, but also in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The greatest revelation of your wisdom on display, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians. Jesus is the wisdom of God. Father, I pray that by your Spirit today we would not leave from here whether we've known Jesus for 10 minutes or 40 years without examining our hearts, but in making sure that not just a portion of our heart is given over to Christ, not that, that, that we would examine every nook and cranny and fully surrender ourselves to the wisdom of God. Lord, there are areas of our hearts where we think we know better. God, in our relationships, in our finances, in, in the church, in our office space. Father, there are areas where we need to take our hearts and fully surrender them to your word and allow the wisdom of God to teach us, train us, so that you may be most glorified in our lives. Lord, the idea and thought is not lost on me that the way in which you demonstrated your wisdom looked like folly to the world. You sent your son to live a life we could not live, to follow every command and, and, and to complete the law, and then to go to a cross to die a criminal's death. Lord, to the world, that looks like folly. And Paul reminds us that, God, you use the foolish things of the world to teach the wisdom of God. God, I pray that we would continually, day by day, turn to you in repentance. Lord, and be renewed and reminded of your grace that is new every single morning. It's in the powerful, wonderful, amazing, gracious name of Christ we now pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.